Sup y'all, and welcome to the Food Network, part eight. In this video, we're gonna continue looking at modern agriculture and ask this essential question. How is agribusiness organized economically and distributed spatially? Agribusiness refers to large-scale corporations involved in modern mechanized industrial agriculture. They are engaged in a massive variety of goods and services within the agriculture industry. They create and work with commodity chains that link several locations of production and distribution of goods or commodities that are traded at the national and global scales. While food and commodities have been traded locally and regionally since antiquity, it was the Europeans who first expanded commodity chains to a global scale, beginning with the Colombian Exchange across the Atlantic, and then expanding as their colonial empires spread throughout the Americas, Asia, Australia, and Africa. Today, large corporations are the largest producers and distributors of food across state and international borders. Just in 2015, large farms with over $1 million in sales in the U.S. accounted for only 4% of all farms, but over 66% of all sales. Now, agribusiness is usually involved with the inputs of a commodity chain, such as pigs and hogs, as you see here. They are also involved with the stages of production, the outputs, or products that are produced. They are also often directly involved with distribution, and even with the product's consumption for example, through advertising. And depending on your stance, this bacon with spray cheese is either the best or worst thing ever. Okay. Poultry, turkey, pork, and most other industries have transformed from single farmers to vertically integrated companies, which means they are businesses that expand into different areas along the same production path. These vertically integrated companies are united through a common owner. Usually, each member of the supply or commodity chain produces a different product or market-specific service. And ultimately, the products combine to satisfy a common need. Companies like Tyson, Purina, Purdue, and Cargill, which is the largest in the United States, operate hatcheries, feed mills, and processing plants. They supply chicks and feed to the farmers or to other corporations. They're involved in providing veterinary care, transportation, slaughtering, packaging, and marketing. So the production of food has transformed from largely a primary activity to more secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and even quinary activities. Since they process and transport their own food, work with bank officers and vendors, and provide a litany of other services. Let's take a closer look at the poultry industry, and specifically at chickens. These birds were among some of the earliest animals ever domesticated, and through more recent selective breeding, a newborn chick will take between 7 and 8 weeks to grow into a full-grown chicken, also called a broiler since that's what you do with them. In the past, most chickens were raised by local farmers who sold them to local butchers, who in turn sold them to the local consumers. This map from the Depression era shows chicken raising scattered throughout the U.S., but concentrated around the Midwest. Looking at this old and blurry map, you can see where corn was predominantly grown, which is the feed of choice for chickens and many other animals for that matter. And look at this photo of a chicken coop circa 1900. This is how many people still think most chickens were raised, but they couldn't be more wrong. Today, the vast majority of chickens are raised in broiler houses and are especially concentrated in the southeast. Broiler raising is the main job of a few producers, not so much the side job of many independent farmers. This graph shows you that the consumption of chickens has increased greatly, and since the 1950s, most broilers have been raised in factories, not on individual farms. Today, we Americans eat more than 100 times the amount of chickens than in the 1930s. So why is this? One of the major reasons has to do with economies of scale, which refers to a proportionate savings in costs gained by an increased level of production. Companies that mass-produce their food are able to buy raw materials in bulk and gain tax benefits from local and state governments, reducing the cost per item produced. This is why if you really need to buy a 10-gallon vat of mayonnaise, your best deal usually is at a big box superstore like Costco, BJ's Wholesale, or Sam's Club. 
Buying in bulk allows you to save money on packaging and incentivizes companies to give you a better deal per item. So how does this work? Well, you can see the price of chicken per pound has indeed fallen dramatically. So each broiler house represents a fixed cost. The rent, venting fans, feed, water, and other costs are relatively steady at around just over $100,000 per broiler house. Whereas the number of chickens is a variable cost. So whether you have 10,000 chickens in a flock or 25,000, the fixed cost is comparatively similar. But the unit cost per chicken decreases, and the average broiler house can produce between 5 and 7 flocks a year. That works out to roughly 150,000 birds per factory on average each year. Now look at this graph. While dated, you can still see the number of farms has decreased over the years while the broilers sold per farm and the total number of broilers sold has grown precipitously. According to the USDA, around 8.7 billion chickens were sold in the U.S. alone in 2015. Now, in the image to the left, you see a bulldozer cleaning up all the chicken crap, and on the right, you see the broiler house all prepared with fresh wood chips on the ground. Here are the baby chicks delivered on day one. They are fed and given water through computerized systems. And you can see in the beginning, they have a plethora of space. And here they are at two weeks, then four weeks, and seven weeks. So you can see as they grow, there is less room to move around. And then finally, here's a broiler at 10 weeks. Another major reason why the U.S. Southeast is such an ideal location has to do with geography. The U.S. Southeast is an ideal location due to better site and situation characteristics. Now, around the Midwest is the Corn Belt, which is the prime source for chicken feed. But the main reason most chickens aren't raised there has to do with cost. The feed can be transported relatively cheaply by truck across the U.S. interstate highway system. Furthermore, the Southeast U.S. has a lower cost of living where people are more willing to work for lower wages. Plus, the warmer weather is ideal for raising broilers, saving a great deal of money. Since the cost of transporting full-grown chickens is more expensive and cumbersome, you can see the major processing plants are close to the broiler houses. And the centrality of the region enables the producers to ship the chicken meat and chicken parts across the U.S. and around the world. So you can see with this more recent map, the locations of poultry production has been consistent for decades. Hog and pig production is done in much the same way, as with many other products produced through agribusiness. However, you can see hogs and pigs concentrated in states like Iowa, North Carolina, and Oklahoma. So hopefully now you have a better idea how agribusiness and industrial agriculture operates and dominates modern food production. And finally, here you see a peculiar photograph from rural China, where these pigs have what looks to be their cousins hanging up overhead. So is this another commodity chain or tragic irony? I'll let you decide. Live or die, make your choice.